This is the Nokia 8.3, and this is my short review because so many of you are just so lazy, you can watch 20 minutes. I see you. The Nokia 8.3 is a really confused phone. On one hand, if you just analyze the specs, you will see that it has way too many missing features for it to qualify as an affordable flagship. Things such as wireless charging, an IP rating for water and dust resistance, and a high refresh rate display. So that leaves us with the biggest question here. How does this phone justify its existence? Why does it cost as much as it does? And is there something that we're not seeing on paper? Let's find out. Before I start, it would be really nice if you guys hit that subscribe button. It would really mean a lot to me. Thanks. So let's start with the hardware of the Nokia 8.3. This is an area where Nokia usually nails it, and I feel like it's no different on this device. Even though the edges of the frame of the display are made out of plastic, which some are saying it could be aluminum coated with plastic, the phone feels super solid in the hand. It just feels more expensive than it actually is. This is also helped by the fact that it feels quite dense. The back of this device is made out of glass, and it only comes in one color option, which Nokia calls Polar Night. As far as colors go, this is a really nice choice here. This color combines the classiness you expect from a gray or a black with the more adventurous color options that you find on gradient colored phones. I especially like the design element of the camera and how it's done with its circular camera pump as it screams Nokia. Overall, from a hardware and feel point of view, I think they absolutely nailed it. Minus the bigger than usual bottom bezel on this thing, which is why I give it a 9 out of 10. This is the first Nokia device with a side-mounted fingerprint scanner, and I think it works really well. It's quite fast, reliable, and can easily be reached with even hands. The display of this device is also really good. Yes, on paper, it's not an OLED and it doesn't have a high refresh rate, but when it comes to LCDs, this is a very high quality LCD panel. Do keep in mind though, is that this phone is really big. It houses a 6.81 inch full HD plus display. So if you don't like big devices in general, this might not be the device for you. Now let's talk about the software and the software experience on the Nokia 3 I'm thoroughly impressed with how well this phone handles day-to-day -day tasks. So as you guys know, this phone has a Snapdragon 765G. And this is my first experience with this chipset. It just breezes through daily tasks and switching between applications and opening applications is lightning quick. I would say for daily usage, I didn't miss the fact that it doesn't have an 800 series processor. What also helps is that the phone's display latency is quite low, so it reacts almost instantly to the touch. The software is also quite robust. I haven't noticed a lot of bugs when using this phone, which makes me think that this is probably one of the best optimized software experiences on a Nokia. This phone is running on Android 10 out of the box as a part of the Android 1 program. And ideally, it should have come out with Android 11 considering where we are throughout the year. Having said that, you're gonna get two years of updates and three years of security updates on this Nokia device. And Android 1 is Android 1. You either like it or hate it. It's a very bare bones Android experience that tries to mimic stock Android as much as possible. If you're a fan of not having any bloatware and a fan of sort of building your device from the ground up, you're gonna really like this experience over here. But if you want more customization option, then there are better options available elsewhere. The only additions to the software that Nokia Mobile have added are the pure display settings, the camera app, which has a lot of nice options, and there are some advanced color temperature options for the display. There is also double tap to wake up and the My Phone app, which is just for support. When it comes to gaming, this phone does quite a good job in terms of playing games at a very decent graphical fidelity settings with good frame rate. It definitely doesn't play games as well as a Snapdragon 800 series processor with a 650 Adreno GPU, but it's quite close. I would say it's about 80% there. The biggest difference you'll notice is when it comes to loading games, as this phone takes a bit longer than a flagship device in terms of opening the games. When it comes to multimedia, I really like watching movies and content on this phone because the LCD display offers balanced colors and there is pure display which enhances the contrast and the colors of the movies that you're watching. What also helps is that even though this phone only has one speaker on the bottom, the speaker is very loud and quite clear. My only complaint is that the location of the speaker is on the bottom left of the device, which means that if you want to watch content, it's better to actually flip it around so you don't block it. Now let's talk about the camera. So this phone has a 64 megapixel main camera with an aperture of f1.89. 
and it captures excellent images throughout. So this is an area where this phone really stands out amongst its peers and amongst phones that have similar specs. This camera feels a lot more comparable to devices that cost $1,000 or around that much, as opposed to phones that cost about $400. The pictures captured are quite crisp, and the phone tries to mimic real-to-life colors as opposed to overly HDR pictures. The camera also resolves plenty of details, and I'm especially impressed with the dynamic range captured on this main camera. The other nice addition on this phone is that the ultra-wide 12 megapixel camera is actually flagship grade as opposed to just there to tick a box. Its color science tries to mimic the same as the main camera, and the details are nicely reserved. Both of these two cameras are also quite competent when it comes to low-light performance. From my experience, whenever I found a scene that I wanted to capture, the phone camera delivers, even in night mode. Compared to Gcam, it just offers more realistic colors and keeps the tone of the image better. So I ended up using it about 80% of the time compared to Gcam. Do keep in mind though, if you're expecting some magical pictures in pitch black rooms, then this isn't exactly the right phone for you. But when a situation arises where you actually see something that you want to capture, this phone delivers most of the time. The macro camera is honestly useless. I just hope they get rid of it in future devices. As for the portrait camera, it's quite useful as this phone actually captures really nice portrait images. When it comes to video, this phone offers a lot of nice features that just makes the video level a bit higher than its competitors. The videos captured are nice and crisp, the colors are quite accurate, and I found the white balance to be good most of the time. There is also a full manual control in the camera and a cinematic mode which enables you to capture H-Log format videos as well as capture videos with a 21 by 9 aspect ratio at 4K 24 frames per second. Talk about a mouthful. So H-Log video is sort of like a RAW format for video, so it captures better dynamic range and better contrast, and you can color grade it directly from the phone thanks to the Cinema Editor app. What I also like about the video capturing on this phone is that the phone nails all the little things that you want from a good video camera. Things such as the smoothness of the zoom, the shakiness and the stability of the video, as well as the overall tone and colors. It also captures very nice audio and manages to reduce the noise quite well, so you end up with very clear and crisp audio. If I had to complain about something on this video camera is that it's not the best when it comes to low light performance. The low light videos just have too much noise creeping in and I don't think the phone handles light very well. I would also love for them to add more options for the video so you get a more expensive experience. So more frame rate options in cinema mode would be really nice, for example. The battery life on the Nokia 8.3 is very good. So it has a 4,500 milliamp battery capacity and it will usually last you about one and a half days of usage. You can expect between five and six hours of screen on time if you're having a mixed usage with Wi-Fi and cellular and between seven and eight hours of screen on time on Wi-Fi. As for the little things, the phone has a very nice, very good haptic motor or vibration motor, which makes typing a much nicer experience. The call quality is also nice and clear, and I had no issues with the Wi-Fi or GPS signals. In fact, I think the Wi-Fi signal on this phone is very, very good. Unfortunately, I couldn't test 5G as it's not an option that's available in the areas that I usually am in. But for most people, this won't be a very useful feature, at least for another year from now. Best value for money, this phone is not, but it does justify its existence within a very specific niche. Its build quality, camera performance, as well as software experience compares a lot closer to $1,000 phones than it does to $400 ones. But if you were to analyze every spec that it has, this is where this phone struggles. And this is why I don't think it's the best value for money. Unfortunately for Nokia, it's very difficult trying to convey its strengths on paper. Having said that, if you pick one up and use it for a day, you start appreciating the value that it offers. Now it just needs a much better story to sell. Anyways, that's it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed this summarized review of the Nokia 8.3. If you did, please don't forget to share, like, and subscribe, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one.